How about that? That's awesome. Uh, big thanks, first of all, to, to Doug and, and Phil and West and the security and folks and all the folks in Augusta for putting this on. This weekend continues to be one of my favorite weekends of the year. I'm a blue teamer. I know we have a few red teamers in the audience. Yeah, there he is. So we got at least one. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, for, for me this weekend, for, I've always considered this like my DEF CON Black Hat this weekend. Like, I just really enjoy all the things that, that have going on here in Augusta. And great to have this stuff going on right here in Georgia as well. So very appreciative of that. So my name is Chris Sanders. Uh, if you don't know about me, Phil did a great introduction. Uh, my background was originally, uh, I got my start in technology, working systems administration for the school district in rural Mayfield, Kentucky that I graduated from. Uh, this is actually Mayfield, Kentucky here. That's all of it. There's not much. <laughs> that is not much. Uh, down there to the left there, there's like a McDonald's, and that little dome right there was the high school. Uh, there's not much there, but uh, it's middle of nowhere for a lot of people, but it was the center of the world for me growing up. Um, so I started there, spent a lot of time in the Department of Defense, uh, helping, working in and helping to build and leading security operations centers. Did some of that similar work in the private sector, worked for a firm called the Guardians for a while. Um, you know, the Amish have what they call room springo, where you kind of go off on your own for a little while. And I did that with a firm called the Guardians. That was my time as a red teamer. That was my room springo. Uh, where I left the blue team for a while. Um, it was very scary and I didn't feel comfortable and so I came back. Uh, <laughs> I uh, did that at Mandy and FireEye for a while before leaving to start my own company, Applied Network Defense. Um, just, I guess, about six months ago, uh, we focused on online training um, in the blue team space. Along with that, um, the Rural Technology Fund was mentioned. We put technology in the hands of rural kids uh, who might not have opportunities to learn about computer science themselves, very much like I was when I was um, in Mayfield, Kentucky. So I've read a couple books. Again, uh, you can win a couple of those signed back at the, uh, the auction table with their the raffle table, so make sure you take advantage of that. Now, we're going to talk about pivoting today. Uh, pivoting is one of those things we talk about it all the time. Um, if you excel in this space and you've been in this space for a long time in the blue team space, you probably will describe to people your job partly as a function of pivoting, right? Pivoting through data. If you're new to this space and you're just learning how to be an analyst, you're probably told a lot, you need to learn how to effectively pivot. But one of the things I've generally noticed is we're not really good at articulating what that means. And that's, if you don't know me, that's kind of my shit, is I focus on kind of the human element of analysis, focus on human psychology and the intersection with blue team work. And then I really try to break that down to fundamental concepts so we can learn those quite a bit better and teach them. Because we have a real problem teaching new people how to be good analysts. We're not very good at it at all. Most of that training really involves telling someone to go watch someone else who's very good at this, and that doesn't really translate very well. On-the-job training is an important part of really any training, but it cannot be the sole part of that training. So we have to talk about fundamentals, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about fundamentals today. So if you're very experienced, hopefully you learn a new way to think about something you're already doing and learn to think about that more effectively and learn how to teach that more effectively. And if you're not, very, if you're not experienced, you're very new to the space, hopefully you learn an important concept that will help you out. So I try to break down every talk I do into just a short sentence about what I think you're gonna get out of it, and that's what you see on the screen here. We're gonna talk about why pivoting is important and why you should devote time to documenting and practicing it. Now, practice is an interesting concept, and that's actually where I want to start. Um, I'm from Kentucky, and if you know anything about Kentucky, we're a basketball state, so of course I'm going to use a basketball uh, analogy. I didn't actually pick a Kentucky player here, so that's going on. But we're going to talk about practice, and I want to frame it through the concept of sports. Because, well, when we think of sports, that's what we think of practicing. Right? So what is practice, and how does it differ from the opposite of practice, which is performance? Right? The two very different things. So I want you to think about, you know, even if you don't know a lot about sports, you kind of understand probably what basketball is, shoot the ball through hoop, two-pointers, three-pointers, and so on. Now I have this broken down into two sections here. We have performance and we have practice. Now in a performance or a game, when it really counts, a really good player who, has a, who gets the ball a lot may get, you know, two or three layups, ten two-point shots, four three-point shots, maybe they'll make 50 uh, rebounds, or excuse me, 50 passes, they'll uh, try to make about ten rebounds, and they'll run maybe three offensive schemes 10 times each, which is not a lot of exposure to very specific skills during the course of a game. Right? That's, if you're only you know, making four three-point shots and you only ever get those four three-point shots every game, you're not really probably going to get much better at three-point shots. That's performance. That's when you're expected to be at your very best. We, most of us in our field, we are expected to perform every single day, but we don't practice a lot. So what is practice? Well, practice is where we take the various aspects of our performance, and we break them down into kind of individualized skills 
and we focus on those. So whereas in a game, you may put up 10 two-point shots, in practice, you may put up 500 two-point shots. Right? We're focusing on those individual aspects of our craft, of our performance, to make it better um, and be better at it. Right? That's why this guy right here, this is Ray Allen. He's one of the best NBA three-point shooters of all time. And it's been said that in a given practice, he puts up uh, nearly 1,000 three-point shots every practice, every single day, which is the dedication it takes to be one of the best in the world at such things. So, now that said, what is the secret of practice? Right? What makes practice practice? What makes it important? Right? And a lot of people would say that it's the amount of time spent. And I, that's actually not the case. It couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, you could go go to a swimming pool every single day to swim, to just get exercise, right? But just because you go swim for two hours every day for a year doesn't actually necessarily mean you're gonna get better at swimming. You might get more fit and better shape and that might help you swim better. But does it absolutely necessarily mean you're gonna get better at swimming in the art of it, or the science of it for that matter? No, you won't. The difference between true experts and people who practice well and the secret of really good practice is it's not that experts log more hours of practice, it's that experts log higher quality practice. So what does that mean? What does it mean to get higher quality practice? The secret to practice is this, and it's a few steps here, but it involves, generally speaking, something I've alluded to already, is studying your craft, figuring out what it means to excel in it, and breaking it down into its component parts. And that's really two, uh, two kind of questions here. Uh, what skills will I use, and what scenarios will I encounter where I will need to use them? Right? With skills, especially not, not even as much in basketball, but more in our field, it's not so much knowing how to use tools, it's knowing when to use them or why to use them. Right? When to access certain types of evidence and why you should and so on and so forth. So breaking it down to those component parts. And then three is probably the most important part, that's developing a feedback loop. Right? Having the ability to know when you're doing one of the things that you're practicing and when you're doing it wrong. Does anybody know what the primary feedback loop is when you're playing sports? I heard it's your coach, right? You have a coach who tells you, you know, you're, you're, if you're throwing a touch, you're throwing passes in football that you need to, you know, tuck your elbow in. If you're, you know, shooting shots, you need to jump off level and square your body up. Those are the kind of things you get. You get people who maybe aren't necessarily the best at doing these things themselves, right? You don't have to be a great player to be a great coach, and I think that's quite honestly true in, in pretty much anything. Um, but you do need to at least understand the mechanics and be able to, to do some of these things to some degree. So developing that feedback loop, that's why coaching is very important. You don't actually have to have coaching, but it certainly narrows the gap much, much more. And then finally, you take the skills, you take the scenarios, and you focus on repeating each action, each skill, learning those skills in the various situations you're going to be encountering them in. So that is basically what we're talking about. We're talking about deliberate practice. And again, I want to focus on the word deliberate. That means you're knowingfully going forth and practicing your craft. Right? Deliberate. That's important. You have to know you're practicing. And practice, again, is different from performance. Can you perform and practice at the same time? I would say not really. That is not deliberate practice. It's performance. So when I talk about these things, I'm talking in terms of something called metacognition. And this is a slide I've put up in, I feel like, just about every presentation I've given in the past three years. So if you've seen me talk, you've seen it before. Metacognition is a fancy psychology word that means thinking about thinking. Right? It's thinking about our craft, thinking about how we do the things we do so we can do them better and specifically so we can learn them better and teach them to others better. So I talk about practice in the vein of metacognition. Now, there's plenty of research out there um, in other fields that show us that being metacognitively aware, so thinking about thinking a lot, improves performance. Right? And not only that, it's shaped entire fields. Medicine is one I point to often. If you uh, work in the medical field, you've gone to medical school. Medical school is 90% about metacognition teaching doctors how to think like doctors, right? 10% of it is memorization, right? Memorizing facts and things like that and talking about the, the different parts of the body and chemical reactions and things of that nature. But 90% of it is learning how to think like a doctor, how to think diagnostically, right? So metacognition is important in that way because two parts here, if you can understand your cognition, you can apply it better. And that means, again, applying it to practice, applying it to learning, and specifically applying it to teaching. I have a firm belief that any room with more than one person in it can be a classroom. Right? And at any given time, I feel like if you're not teaching or learning, you're probably failing. So with that in mind, if you can better understand your craft, you can better teach to other people, better seize those opportunities, I think we're generally all better off for it in a field where we don't have a lot of really uh, great formalized structured education in the investigative process as it pertains to uh, network security. So 
With Medic Cognition, it never fails any time I ask someone what they do as a blue teamer. I say, okay, what is it you do? What is in office space, you know, what is it you say you do here? Right? <laughs> and once you once you wait through the jokes and stuff like that, you know, it generally comes down to someone saying, okay, I take some type of input, I look at a lot of evidence, I connect the dots, and I get some type of output that means there is either an incident that has occurred or that no incident has occurred and I can move on to the next thing. So it's connecting the dots. But what does that mean? Well, I frame this through something um, I very creatively named the investigation process, right? And this probably looks somewhat familiar to you. It looks kind of like a scientific method, right? Because it's a very similar type process. Um, in this process, we have an observation that can come in the form of an IDS alert, something a machine generated for you. It can come from something you found yourself, some type of hunting observation. Um, it can come from a phone call from the FBI that says they found a bunch of your data on someone else's server that was compromised. Those aren't the fun ones. Uh, maybe they are depending on your position. Uh, so those are your observations that lead you to believe something warrants an investigation. So when that happens, you get into this middle part, which is really the meat and potatoes of the investigation process, wherein you ask the question, you generate a hypothesis, wherein you're leaning one way towards a specific answer to that question, and then you go out and seek an answer to it. Generally, I find most people focus exclusively on the answer seeking. Oh, I have an alert, I should go look at the PCAP. Well, what are you looking for in the PCAP? Right? We don't just pull back a whole day worth of PCAP. In some organizations, you can't do that, right? It's just way too much data. You have to get just the data you want, and if you need to pivot around in that, that's fine. We'll talk about that as we go on. But it's all about asking the right questions so you get the right data. Um, and hypothesis is an important part of that because as humans, we're all biased. Bias is neither a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing that is a product of our mindsets. Um, and it can, it can be either one of those. So we ask questions. We generate hypothesis. We seek out an answer that's based upon evidence. Evidence is, of course, important. We see it kind of as the foundation of this. And once you have evidence to back up a conclusion, maybe that's the end of your investigation, but in most cases, it's probably going to get more questions, right? So questions and answers, we get more questions and answers. You go through this a few times until you're satisfied with the uh, data you have, you can actually present a conclusion, and that's your investigation, right? And from there, you can make decisions. Again, all decisions should be based upon evidence. They're kind of the foundation of this whole deal. So this mirrors the scientific method, and we don't really have the scientific method because uh, a bunch of guys with long beards sat around and said, hey, how should we do science? That's not how it works. They sat around and they said, okay, how are people, how is scientific discovery happening? How is that happening from a mental and a cognitive perspective? And they studied that and what they came up with was, for most science and most scientific discovery, the scientific method was how that works. So they took something that was happening subconsciously, they brought it forward into uh, the conscious world, and now most people learn it as early as maybe first, first or second grade. They're learning, at least to some degree, the scientific method, right? It's a teaching tool. When you can take things that we're already doing cognitively that are working, and take those and bring those forth and teach them and use them as teaching tools, that's a win. That's a lot of what education is, right? So that's the same thing I feel about this. I don't call it the investigation process and say this is what you should do. I think this is what we are all already doing, whether you realize it or not, right? That's an important thing to realize. Now, we don't probably pay as much conscious attention to some parts of this as, as we need to, right? Like I said, most people tend to focus on answers. Just give me the data and I'll figure it out not really a good way to do it. Most of your really experienced, really good analysts are not doing that. They're asking questions, and they might actually realize they're doing it, but they're going to have to very specific bits of data to answer very specific bits of questions. So my general theory on this is if at any point in an investigation you cannot articulate what question you were trying to answer, you are fundamentally lost, right? And if you don't realize it, you will soon realize it, or you're just going to miss something completely and we start to with that. So questions are very important. Now, I talk about this process um, to kind of pivot into the next thing, pivot, uh, which is evidence, right? Because evidence is how we're going to frame our continued discussion uh, today on uh, pivoting. Now, just to level set on what I'm talking about when I talk about evidence, I think all of us kind of know what evidence is, but evidence is basically the data that helps us prove something happened. Um, it can be really anything. It can be a log file. It can be network activity. Um, an IP address by itself may not be evidence, but the fact that it appears in a log file makes it evidence. It appears in the flow data. That maybe communication occurred. It then becomes evidence that some activity happened. And what we're really doing here with evidence is using it to go through that investigation process to bridge the gap between perception and reality. That's what an investigation is, right? We, there's a reality of events that actually transpired on our network. We have a perception of what those events are, and ideally those things converge into one place. And that's the process of investigating. Conveniently enough, that process of bridging the gap between perception and reality, there's also another word for that. It's cognition, which is learning. Right? So the more we can learn about learning, 
the more we can apply that to investigating, it's really the same thing. An investigation is just a microcosm of how humans learn in general, right? Which is kind of a mind-blowing thing when you think about it. But if we better understand how we learn, we become better investigators, which is kind of uh, my way forward uh, for the past few years. So evidence, any of these things can help us prove what's going on. They can use to, of course, answer questions. That's the most common. Evidence will also certainly get more questions, especially from a hunting perspective. You're going through a bunch of Windows logs. You see a weird username, evidence of it logging into a specific system. You know that shouldn't be there. Well, that begets questions. Right? So that's what evidence can do for us. Now, an important thing with evidence that's really important is all evidence is certainly not created equal, but the lens for which we view evidence can vary and dramatically impact our investigation. Right? I want to give you an example. Uh, a friend of mine recently um, sent me a picture of this stock chart. And his comment was, man, this, this would have been a good thing, uh, a good stock to be in. Right? And if you look at this chart, you'd say yes. Right? If you look relative to January 4th, which we see right here uh, through the week, we see obviously the chart rising. Uh, we see that in a given day, it's risen uh, over 20%. We see here that the increase, the stock has increased over 1,000%, right? So if I were to ask you the question and say, would this have been a good stock to be in this week? What would you say? Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's not a trick question, this one's not, this one at least. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, this week it is. Now, what is the purpose of a stock price? What is it supposed to actually represent to some degree? value of a company right now if we're going to ask you is this a good company and you're just looking at this data what would you potentially be inclined to say for that right yeah for this week you're like yeah something's going on right here but then you can transform the data a little bit well let's let's zoom out a little bit um i don't know if you can see this number here but this is of course over uh, five years and you see the company has <coughs> declined uh 98 in value uh, so now if i were to re-ask you the question is this a good company? Yeah, it's hard to say yes to that one, right? It, it looks like maybe not. Um, and actually, you can't tell, but if you're to zoom in in this little area right here, which is where this was from, you actually see plenty of days like, you know, weeks like this where it's up quite a bit and then down just as much more. Chris, people want to So, uh, but yeah, so basically the, the moral of this story is, right, the way we look at data greatly impacts the, how we answer specific questions, right? And I think we all know that, but I think this is a good example that shows you that. And this is actually just taking a small subset of data, pulling back on that data and looking at a larger subset of the same data to, again, better answer questions. And the question we asked made a very, very big difference. Again, a stock price is supposed to represent the value of the company, but that's not what it represents to everybody, right? Some people it represents just a dollar amount, and if I can get it in the right place, then I can you know, make or lose money. So that's how it works. Now, in terms of data transformation, there are a lot of ways to, tra to uh, transform data. Um, what I teach in my classes, and the kind of guiding principle I follow, is something I call RECAP. So that stands for Reduction, Expansion, Chart, Aggregation, and Pivot. And these are really the five primary ways people are going to uh, transform data and get more out of it, right? So any given time we're accessing evidence, data it's probably because we've searched for it. we're either doing that um, you know maybe you're doing that in elsa or an elf stack or maybe a commercial tool a swamp or something like that and you have a question you're asking and you search for data and get it back right and then maybe you can answer that question immediately but in a lot of cases maybe you need to transform the data to better answer and these are again the five primary transformations i generally see we're not going through all these in depth but reductions and expansions, a reduction is taking a larger subset of data and drilling in further. So maybe you've got too much data and you go in further on a specific time frame. Maybe you've got a PCAP of everything on a single host and you drill down to just one port for that host. It's requerying the same data, uh, but on a more finite set of criteria. Expansions, just the opposite of that. That's kind of what we looked at with the, uh, the stock chart example, wherein you had a very small, you just had a week of data and you expanded to five years. So it's expanding from a smaller subset. Charts, those are visualizations. Uh, bars, lines, graphs, uh, those really horrible geo maps that everyone makes us have that actually provide no value in almost every case. Those would fall into that category. Um, <coughs> aggregations, um, taking a single field within a larger data set, finding all the unique <coughs> values, and then sorting by those. So uh, one of my, my favorite examples is taking the user agent field from HTTP data. Right, there should only do, you know, be 
a certain number of user agents on any given network. People with very large networks here are probably laughing at that, but there should only be a certain amount of that. Um, and you can look for the really common stuff, sort it, look for the least common user agents that exist on your network. And if you do that on any reasonably sized network and you've never done it before, I guarantee you at some point you will find malware that way. Um, or maybe something worse. Or maybe just an admin who's written some type of script that's going out and doing something that's not supposed to. But nonetheless, that's an aggregation. Now, that leads us to pivot, which is what we're going to spend the rest of our time uh, talking about here is pivoting. I think this is probably the most important um, aggregation and I, or excuse me, the most important transformation. And I don't say that lightly, I say that with actual numbers to back it up. Um, so I did a little bit of research um, with real world investigations and I tracked all the investigations. And I said, okay, for any investigation that occurred, started from an alert where an actual positive finding was found, something malicious was found, what percentage of the time were specific uh, data transformations used, right? So I grouped expansions and reductions together because they're pretty much hand in hand, and those were used in every single investigation. Now, I don't spend a lot of time talking about expansions and reductions because they're fairly trivial. We all get the concept of zooming in or zooming out on data based upon different fields. Pivots here were the next most things, 76%, uh, followed by aggregations, followed by charts, and it's hard to see charts there, but it's less than 1%. Um, we tend to put, you know, charts can, visuals can be useful. We tend to put a little bit too much value in them. Um, in terms of these other things which are a lot more useful. So this is for alert driven investigations. Now I did the same thing for hunting based investigations. Um, you can see it really just caused a lot of these numbers to kind of creep up. I didn't have as much data to work with on the hunting side. A little harder to get that data and, to, and do that, but I did have some. Um, you see in this case, uh, expansions and reductions were still at 100%, pivots went up to 92%, and aggregations went way up. So we can kind of draw the conclusions here. Aggregations, incredibly important for hunting, maybe even significantly more so than um, than general alert driven investigations. But nonetheless, we also say that expansions and reductions as well as pivots are useful in both types of investigations, whether starting with an alert or starting with uh, just some type of manual human generated hunting based input. So anytime I can, when I wanna say something's the best or better than something else, I wanna try to back it up with numbers and I was able to do that to some degree here. Okay, so let's get into pivoting. I wanna talk a little bit about pivoting theory, what it means, some examples of it, and then we'll get into some examples of applied pivoting with some tools and things of that nature. So pivoting, pretty simple concept, I think. Basically, you perform a search in a data source, you get a result back. You take a result from, the, from that search and use it to query another data source, right? That's it, that's a pivot, right? So you see a data source one in green, you take a field from that or a value from that field and query data source two, and that's essentially a pivot. So what are we doing here? We're connecting two different data sources together, and that's a beautiful thing. I don't see very many investigations at all that are ever really fully solved with a single data source. The beauty of network security monitoring and our security, I mean, and all these tools we use is that they allow us to connect all these different data sources together, and we have these tools that make that easier for us. So a pivot is what allows us to do that. Now, sometimes these pivots occur within a single tool. Sometimes we have to go to other tools. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But that's essentially, in essence, what a pivot is when we talk about pivoting theory. Now, we can think of a lot of good examples of pivots, right? So here's, um, here's probably one of the most common ones is we have an alert. An alert is an evidence source, right? It comes with some type of data from the event that triggered it. We're calling network IDS. It's probably gonna come with a source or destination IP. You can take that, you can look at that alert, take that source or destination IP, and pivot to PCAT data, right? That's a, that's a very common pivot that people are gonna do. So that's connecting those two data sources. Now, we can get tempted when you say, well, Chris, didn't the alert come from the PCAT data in general that, you know, is that technically the same data source? Well, kind of, but not really. They're generated by generally two different tools in most organizations, uh, the alert versus the PCAT. Um, another example, uh, sticking with network-based data sources, is starting with flow data. And this is something I generally recommend is if you have a broad range of data that you need to search for, search first with flow data because you can store it a lot longer, you can search it a lot quicker, find the specific time frame or specific host or ports that you're really interested in with flow data, and then use that, take the re results of that, query the PCAP data. So you can do that just based upon IP, you can do it based upon uh, ports, especially like if you want to focus down on one specific TCP conversation. Right, so that's pivoting uh, on the network there. And we're gonna use the same scheme where the data sources are green and the pivots are blue uh, throughout the rest of the uh, talk, so pay attention to that. Now, pivots in practice let you do a lot of things. Of course, they let you connect data sources together. What we're doing here, as you see, is depicted on the top, is when I talk about how answers beget more questions and questions beget answers and so on and so forth, pivoting is actually the tactical method 
which lets us apply that theoretical concept. Right? And that's very important, and, and we can talk about investigation process all day long, but that's kind of theory, and you want to apply that to somewhat a little closer to practice and tactics, well, it's the process of pivoting that allows us to do that. Again, it ties questions to answers. We can use that in a lot of different ways. Um, one of those is to move from lower to higher context data sources. That example I just talked about, about flow data to PCAP data, flow data is a low context data source, PCAP is a high context data source. So we're moving in and out like that, which helps us be more efficient. And efficiency is important, right? Security is a cost center. Security is only effective if we can keep the cost of it low. We want to try to keep that cost lower than the adversary can uh, increase their cost to attack us, right? So uh, moving from host to network-based data sources, that's important. People ask me all the time, Chris, if you could only have host-based data or network-based data, what would you have? And my answer is always yes. Uh, I'm not going to choose. So you generally need both of them in a lot of cases to investigate something effectively. So connecting those in some way and finding those pivot points that allow you to do that, incredibly, incredibly important. Moving from internal to external data sources is important. We mostly think of evidence in terms of our own internal sources, but open source intelligence resources, like all the ones Rob showed a little while ago, those are evidence sources, right? Especially like reputation-based things. If some reputation-based you know, IP boy list that this specific IP address was associated with all this other badness, there, that's some degree evidence, and you want to you know, pull that into your investigation. Right? So we have to consider those open source intelligence, those external data sources, as well as our internal ones. We've got to connect those together. It's incredibly important. So those are pivots in practice, and that's what they let us do. Uh, a couple other examples. Um, let's say you have a PCAP you search for, and you're looking at HTTP traffic, and you see a domain that looks weird. You know, not evil.ru.123, right? That definitely sounds weird. So you take that domain and you can pivot to OSINT. So that's an example of pivoting from internal data source to external uh, data source with open source intelligence information. Let's say you have a proxy and it's a username aware proxy, which are uh, great, right? Because that provides a really nice pivot into from your network to your host. So if you are looking at the proxy data and you see something weird, whether you've been led to it from an alert or from hunting, maybe you're doing the user agent thing I talked about earlier, well, you can take that username, pivot to the Windows log, to help determine if maybe the user who made that request is infected with something, it wasn't actually them, or, or who knows, right? So that's a pivot from network to host. Another pivot here, uh, this one's specific on the host. Say you're in the registry, you're looking for auto runs, right? Looking for auto runs that shouldn't be there. That's a good habit to get into, especially on critical servers. Looking at those normal auto run locations, and you see a file name that looks quite suspicious. Well, pivot over to the actual file itself, and then you can take that file and throw it in the sandbox or reverse it or what have you, uh, see where it came from, et cetera. So you can pivot from the registry, from that file name to the actual file itself. And I, I put distinction here because is a file name equivalent to a file? No, right, file names can change. So uh, a file name is a representation of a file and we have to consider that kind of abstraction when we consider evidence. That some things merely represent other things and are not actually equivalent to the thing. Right? Just like a domain is not equivalent to an IP address, it can just represent it. An IP address is not equivalent to a physical system, it can just represent it. Right? I see people whose minds are just like <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that isn't too confusing. So, now that was, um, was kind of you know, individual pivots, but realistically pivots kind of come in bunches. Right? So I have this example here of an IDS alert. Let's say it's an IDS alert for a suspicious file download. That's not a really good IDS alert name, but it is what it is. So we have that, and what are we going to do? We have an input, we're in the investigation process, so we're going to ask questions. Now, this isn't maybe necessarily the first question you would ask, but it's a reasonable question. Is the host the file was downloaded from legitimate? As in, is it a legitimate website, or is it something that is probably malicious or just spun up to host this file? Well, what do we have? We have the alert, and it provides us some information. This is a network-based IDS alert, so we have an IP address. So we can take that IP address and just pivot straight over to open source intelligence information, drop it into any of our favorite sites that take IP addresses and spit out whether they've known them to be bad or associated with malware, and that's an internal and external pivot. We can also, let's say that alert doesn't include a domain name, we're interested in a domain name because it's maybe email-based or web-based. We can take that alert, take the IP import, and pivot over to the PCAP, and then from the PCAP we can take the domain from it and pivot to open source intelligence information. Right, so we did two pivots there. Did y'all see that? We went from alert to PCAP and then from that PCAP to the OSINT information. And that's assuming the alert didn't already have that domain information. So that's a two-stage pivot. Another question. Well, we have a suspicious file. What does it do? Well, 
we have already looked at OSINT information. We've already pulled some of that out, maybe with the IP address. Maybe we dropped the IP address and the virus total. It pointed us to a hash value. Well, we can take the hash value, go out and query uh, for the particular binary itself, or maybe we can actually get it from our own network, but maybe we're getting it from online too, and we're gonna drop that into a sandbox, right? And that's gonna give us at least some answers in regards to what does the file do. Is it gonna give us all the answers? Not entirely. In this case, we'll say for the purpose of the example that this was a dropper, right? It's a file that you download, or that gets on a system and its sole purpose is to download something else, right? Well, with that information in mind, we want to know, did the file execute, right? You might ask, well, we want to know what did it drop, but before we know what did it drop, we probably want to know if it executed. We're going to kind of answer those both in parallel here. Uh, we have our sandbox data, which tells us what domains the dropper is uh, coded to connect to. We can take those domains, pivot it over to bro HTTP logs. We can search for all our bro HTTP logs for those domains, and if we see those, then we know, hey, this thing probably executed and at least attempted to connect out to one of these things. Um, from the sandbox data we have, we can also generally, uh, depending on the sandbox or if we're manually reversing it, we can take the dropped file itself and take it and drop it back into the sandbox or re-reverse it. For any of these, you can basically sub-reversing, manual reversing for sandbox. But it's a dropper, it's dropping a file, we can maybe get that file and then drop it back in the sandbox to see what it actually does, what the end game is of the infection chain. From there, let's say it installs something on the host, we can get a process name from it, which we have, uh, we have right here. You take that process name, well, if you have maybe sysmon configured and you're logging process execution, well, query all that data in your, your, your sim or in Elsa or in Elk or in Splunk and uh, see if that process name exists on any of your hosts, especially particularly in the time frame in which all this occurred. <coughs> right? So here we have a couple steps of pivoting. And this, these three steps right here can really kind of encapsulate a lot of entire investigations to such a degree. And that's, again, answering the question, did the file execute? Um, let's talk about scoping for a minute. You want to scope this attack a little bit better? Well, did anyone else download the same file? We have our open source intelligence information we already pivoted to earlier. We have a hash value. Well, let's take that hash value and let's go look at the bro file log, which is going to have hashes in it. Really, any data source, we could look at any data source that would have hashes, like a sysmon log. We can certainly start with bro files and see if anyone else downloaded the same file. So that's a really good scoping exercise. Chances are one person did it, especially in a large organization. Maybe a lot of people did it. Did anyone else communicate with the domain IP hosting the, uh, uh, that says word doc, say malware file. Um, so in this case, we have the HTTP proxy data we already looked at where we saw that the download occurred. We can take the domain from that, pivot again to bro HTTP logs, or we can also just take the alert, which has an IP address that the initial connection was associated with, and pivot straight into bro com logs. So a couple ways to answer that question. Everybody follow what we're doing here with all these pivots? So this is more realistic pivoting and that we're pivoting to answer questions and those pivots may come uh, in clusters. Now, this was fairly linear, the exercise we went through. Realistically, pivoting is about choices and asking questions is about choices. And so the path can look a lot different. This is a different scenario. I'm not gonna go through it in depth here, um, but you can see that uh, this is kind of a hunting scenario. You discover a process whose name leads you to believe it might be malicious. So you're starting with sysmon process logs, you pivot over to bro files, and from there you have choices to make. You can pivot straight from there to OSINT information. You can pivot over to HTTP logs to get a domain. You can pivot on the responder IP address to Flowdata or PCAP or digging in that way. It's all about decisions and asking the right question. Now, the question that I would often get asked here is, well, does the path matter as long as you get the right, an right answer? And I would say absolutely yes, the path matters. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, you can actually go on YouTube and look at my talk I did here last year about investigation paths and why you might want to choose flow as your first step over PCAP or something like that. Um, it kind of answers that question that's a little beyond the scope of this particular call. But nonetheless, pivoting, you're asking all these questions, you have choices to make, and really one of the things that often defines a good analyst is making the right decision with regards to what are the right questions to ask at the right time. Now, I want to talk about learning how to pivot and some observations I've made, and before I do that, just to get everyone on the same page, when I talk about evidence, I generally refer to it in realms, um, and particularly, um, Network, OSINT, memory, and uh, the projector kind of washed it out, but that middle triangle is its host. So, um, so evidence, uh, I'd like to say evidence fall in one of those realms, network, host, open source intelligence, or uh, memory uh, data sources. So with that in mind, um, the general skill development I see going from novice to experienced experts is that novices who are, um, and I use that term to describe people who are very new to this field with little to no experience, 
they generally become really adept really quickly at doing single realm pivots. So when I say single realm, I mean network to network, host to host, right? So from a PCAP to a flow, that's a pretty easy one for people to grasp. Single realm pivots, really easy to grasp really early on. Also, people are, maybe even to a detriment, really good at taking things and dropping them into websites, uh, which is oh, fine for IP addresses, not so fine when people take binaries and just willy-nilly upload them to virus total without much thought, right? That's not, not necessarily a great thing. But people are really good at taking those things and pivoting to OSINT early on, so that's my observation there. Now, as people get a lot more experience, they get a lot better with cross-realm uh, pivots. So pivoting from host to network is the biggest one. Is knowing what data sources exist on the host and network side, knowing what pivots connect them, and actually making that pivot successful. Um, furthermore, pivoting from OSINT into the network. Now, can you think of an occasion why you want to pivot from something you found at OSINT into the network? I think the most common is probably I've gone out and Vendor XYZ has put out a blog post on this malicious activity, and I'm learning about it, and I want to search for those things in my network. So that's, that's hunting, right? That's a pivot that is hoping to find something evil, not necessarily in the course of an existing investigation of something that's already evil, but trying to find it in the first place. So that's a pivot from outside in. That also would include things like hunting through virus, total binaries, finding weird things in that, and plugging those into your network to see if you can find evidence. So that's pivoting external to internal. And then really on the expert side, uh, memory <coughs> forensics is the area where I think uh, most folks don't get into it until they get uh, significantly more experienced in their careers. So I don't see people doing a lot of pivoting into and out of memory um, data, memory evidence based evidence until they get more to that expert level. <coughs> generally, my observation. So what you do with this information, well, that depends on you. But it, this is kind of, I would say, the roadmap to how people learn to pivot over their career. And with this in hand, you could probably accelerate some of that uh, that experience. So. That was kind of pivoting theory. But let's talk about applied pivoting and how we actually do it, um, kind of hands-on keyboard. Um, who knows what type of data this is, what the source of this data is? Bro, bro right, it's bro data. So uh, if, if, now, the beauty of bro data, and I think, you know, a lot of people would ask me, you know, why do, you know, why do people love bro data so much? And a lot of people have a hard time articulating that other than just it's awesome, it helps us answer a lot of questions. That's all great. But I think one of the reasons people really love bro data is because of what I've highlighted here. These connection IDs, of course, BroData takes the network-based data, breaks it out into specific logs based upon particular analyzers, and it connects all those logs together with these unique uh, unique IDs, right? So we see here we actually have a, um, the same connection ID across these four logs, and we have a Bro Weird log, the Bro HTTP log, Bro Files, and Bro Con. It's all the same connection. And it's tied together with that ID. Well, that's actually a built-in pivot, right? So I know Bro is one data source, but I consider each individual Bro log kind of its own evidence source. So pivoting between those is generally speaking a lot more effective in terms of time and answering questions expeditiously than looking at a PCAP file which contains all of this. Right, if you have a tool that facilitates it well. Um, and any tool that allows you to click on these particular uh, connection IDs and pivot across things is a tool that's gonna facilitate that well. So that's one of the reasons I think people love Bro so much is that it allows, it has this built-in pivot between these different connection points. Now, how do we access um, the data we have to do these pivots. Well, um, we obviously know Seagull here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so we have, we have, we have Squeal, and um, one of the great things about Squeal is that you can simply click on, you know, one to two clicks, and you can pivot over to PCAT, right? And a lot of people ask me, especially people new to the field, they look at Squeal, and Squeal's a great tool, but they look at it and say, man, this looks like it was made in like 1987. I was like, hey, you're not far off. <laughs> um, and so Squill, not, you know, it's not been brought up to date, visually speaking, but it works really well. And one of the reasons people like that is because we have that really easy built-in pivot to PCAP data, which is definitely one of our most valuable data sources. And because Squill allows you to pivot based upon IP and ports, so you're going to a specific connection rather than just pulling hours or days back at a time, it's a very efficient pivot in that regard. So that's one of the reasons people like Squill. Um, not much different than, than Squirt in some ways. Squirt allows some of these same uh, pivots. You see here, it's a little hard to see. We have pivots to uh, a lot of uh, open source intelligence things based on this IP address I clicked here. So um, you can really tell tools that were designed by analysts for analysts as both uh, Squeal and Squirt were, right? Because they have these pivots because even if they weren't calling them pivots, uh, Bam and Paul knew that one of the things that were critical to their success when they were creating these tools was being able to go connect multiple data sources together. Right, so we see that in these tools, both of course on Security Onion. Um, this is um, 
uh, Rob gave me this slide uh, from, uh, from Histole. He was, he was just talking about fandom. Um, this is kind of where we extrapolate and get some of the playbooks and things, right? Because in terms of automation, you can't, I'm of the belief that the human is at the center of the investigation process, and you can't automate most decision making, but you can automate collecting data and presenting it to the human in the most efficient way possible so that they can make those decisions. Right? And generally speaking, anytime you have an alert, if you have that alert enough times and you spend time thinking about it, you can probably say, okay, anytime I get that alert, here are the first one to two to three steps I would take, the first one to two to three questions I would ask and the data I would need to answer them. So if you can do that, well then why not have a tool that can go out and, and basically you know, ask those questions for, or for you, get the data back for you so it's ready right there with the alert. Um, and there's tools now that do that. Uh, Rob's tool, Phantom is one of those. Uh, there's a lot of orchestration tools. Uh, Command does it. Uh, FireEyes Cat does it. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of tools that are starting to do this. So, in terms of open source from okay. Uh, so in terms of maturity of tools that do this, you know, I think one of the key criteria you need to make uh, a part of your evaluation, you're evaluating investigative tools, is kind of this scale right here. And it's basically the evolution of pivoting capabilities. At very minimum, a tool should allow you to pivot from results to similar data in the same tool, right? That's, that's baseline, that's minimal, that's things that, that uh, a lot of the tools we've discussed already will do. Beyond that, tools should allow you to pivot from results to external data sources. These are like OSINT things, things out on the internet or what, what have you. Uh, particularly, actually mostly um, OSINT type stuff. Level three is they should allow you to pivot from results to internal data sources, so your own data sources. Right? If you have a PCAP store here or a flow store there, the tool would allow you to pivot to that in some way from whatever data is natively in the tool. So pivoting outside of the tool to your own data. Level four is context aware pivoting, so anytime you click on something, so if I click on an IP address, don't give me every single data source I have. Know which ones actually have that field and which ones will actually generally be useful to me based on the context of the given event. Uh, and finally is what I talked about a minute ago, automated data retrieval based on common pivots that can be predefined. Right? That's kind of, I think, the highest level of maturity in terms of pivoting capability. Uh, again, collecting data for pivoting can certainly be automated. Making decisions based on the data coming back, that's got to be the human. <clears throat> so a couple ways, I'm going to give you just a couple ways I think you can get started kind of learning more about pivots in your own network and practicing that a little bit more. One of those, I think, is to create a data source wiki. If you've been around me much, I'm a big advocate. Every SOC, or even if it's a one-person SOC, should have some type of wiki where you collect and centralize your knowledge. So what I would recommend is a two-part addition to your existing wiki. And it can be media wiki, it can be doku wiki, it can be confluence. I don't care what it is as long as it allows you to centrally store information. If you're a one-person SOC, it can be a Word document or a Google doc. I don't care. It's something where you can write this stuff down. Um, the difference between science and screwing around is, is writing it down, right? So, <laughs> so section one of this thing is, uh, is data sources. So that's very simply. I want you to list every single data source you have, and I want you to make those each your own individual page. On those pages, I want you to put how to access the data source, how it's created, how long it is retained on average, and what fields exist within it. We can all probably do that, right? That's not a large task. I bet mean, you could probably do this and. For a large organization, maybe three or four hours, and a smaller one, maybe an hour of your time. Chances are you probably know all these off the top of your head. <clears throat> That's step one. Step two, I want you to make another section for your most searched fields. Right? We have tools that will facilitate this. This is a screenshot from ELSA, the, uh, the query history tab. There's a bunch of query history up at the top. You can click on that, it'll show you your recent queries. Just go through, go through that. Just scroll down a few pages. You can probably find most of your most common fields. Uh, you can do the same thing in Elk. Most tools have some type of query history capability. So find those out and look for your most searched fields and make a page that lists your top 20 search fields and put them into a table. On the left, you have the field. On the right, you have all the data sources that contain that field. That way, you hire someone new. They say, okay, I have this hash file. What can I do with this ha or hash, hash value? What can I do with this hash value? Well, they can go and see that's one of your top 20 most search fields, here are all the data sources that have it, and you're hot linking those back to the data source page we created here. And that's when they learn about the data source, that's when they learn how to access it, how long it's created, and so on and so forth. Right? So it's basically a knowledge base of the data source you have available, providing value, how you can use those in the investigation process. Does that make sense? Does that seem like something you all want to do? Good. 
I expect many of you to send me screenshots of this to prove you did it. That's your right. <laughs> <laughs> So um, that's the data source week. I think that's one of the first things you can do. Uh, the next thing I do, I made a very stupidly simple app, and but app is a very strong word. It's 26 lines of, uh, uh, of code in an HTML template uh, where you can actually take your, your data sources. So here I have a couple data sources. You see, you see uh, bro HTTP, you see bro files, and you see the fields associated with those here. Right, take those, put them into a CSV, and create a, a, what I call a pivot map. Um, this is very simple, D3, um, force directed graph. Um, you see here, these are all the bro logs. Here's bro SSL, here's bro SMTP, bro DNS. And here are the fields they have in common. You can trace those connections. Here's timestamp, ID, port, and so on. Um, admittedly, if with a ton of data sources, this is going to look like spaghetti and not be the best thing. I don't really think this is necessarily the best way to visualize these things. But for 26 lines of bash and an HTML template, this is the best I can do for today. <laughs> so we'll have to start there. It's very simple. I've just uh, I created a sample file called so.csv with a bunch of security onion data sources um, listed within it um, in the repo. And you just cut that out to uh, pivotmap.sh, uh, redirect to map.html, and that gets you your, uh, your data. So that's, uh, that's out there on GitHub. I'll have the link up in a minute. Uh, special thanks goes to Jason Smith, who's sitting here on the front row, because of those 26 lines I harvested. 19 of them from a tool he wrote uh, called Slow Plotter. So, thanks, Jason. <laughs> um, so, final thoughts. Um, if you learn anything today, know that great analysts know what data they have available, how to access it easily, and how to pivot to and from it and between different data sources to get the answers they need to questions. And of course, the single most important thing in any investigation is the ability to ask effective and appropriate questions in the correct order. I think practicing pivots is important. It makes a difference in your ability to perform as an analyst. It helps us to be able to articulate not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it. And this talk is somewhat in that, uh, in that spirit. So um, again, your homework is to build a pivoting section of your wiki. I'm going to hold every single one of you to that. Every single one. I see a lot of thumbs up. Good. Uh, you can download the tool I just mentioned. Again, it's stupidly simple. It's very awkward bash code. There's a lot of ways it can be improved. It's Open source, do what you want to do with it. If, if you uh, want to drop some improvements in there, by all means, feel free. You can use some more color coding, maybe some, uh, some tweaking to the D3 template, so on. But it's, it's out there on GitHub. So feel free to use that uh, as you may. Um, so that's it's pretty much the talk. If you want to engage me more and learn more about this stuff, um, you can reach me on these different outlets. Um, I teach a course on this stuff called Investigation Theory. I look around the room and see a lot of people have taken my Investigation Theory course. This is not straight from there, but it's tangential to a lot of the things we learn in that about how to investigate things and what it means to be a good analyst. So with that said, if you have questions, I'll be glad to take them. Either the presentation was that good or it made no sense at all. <laughs> one right you mentioned the memory, like experts go straight to memory, but uh, there is no memory if I can do security on you. Um, not particularly, but I know about now. Oh, you can run those tools on security, I think, certainly. Everything gets into Elk eventually. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Not necessarily security, I mean, center comment as far as memory focus. Anybody else? Doing more? Else? I wonder if you have any thoughts on how uh, we can grow in security, onion to improve pivot ability between the kids realms of data. All the question and answer is when you get there, pivoting back and forth between Windows log and so thoughts on growing and security and onion in terms of providing like more opportunities to pivot from network yeah, to host. Those, those two realms are a little bit kind of tricky to jump between them. Yeah. Well so the interesting thing about network security monitoring I think is that, that term gets interpreted a lot of ways. Network security monitoring traditionally was focused specifically on network based data. Right? So most people who are in SMT are lean more towards the network side, and I'm no exception for that. I'm much more knowledgeable on the network side than I am the host side. I think those are converging together more, but also those fields are growing dramatically uh, in that it's very hard to know a ton about either one uh, and go very deep in them, right? So, you know, there's the ability, I mean, there, there are things like OSEC on, uh, on Security Onion, which is, which is certainly a good option. Um, you know, the great thing about it is, especially with the, the alpha or the, um, the, the technical preview ELK stuff that's going on, is you can feed all that host data into something like ELK, or you can feed it into ELSIC even. Right? Like, so that, you have the ability to feed that data in. Um, it's a little more manual because it's not automatically doing all that for you right now, but 
don't let that, you know, don't let that scare you. I mean, it's built to be, you know, security on to some degree is built to be, you know, customized for your own network and, and get those data sources in. So I think I think with the tools that exist with Elsa and particularly with Elk that the technical previews going on is a really great platform for ingesting that data, normalizing it really well, and being able to pivot effectively between those network and those Doug, are you satisfied with that answer? Is that Jeff? Well done, sir. Is that a nice, is that a nice pivot into your discussion later? Oh. I like it. You just wait and see. Thank y'all.